You're listening to the Hazard Ground Podcast with service members from across the military sharing their stories of combat and survival. And now, here's your host, Mark Zeno. Welcome into the Hazard Ground Podcast. As always, we appreciate you joining us each and every week. Before we get to this week's guest, and a special edition of this week's guest, who was a repeat guest here on the Hazard Ground, who has a very specific purpose for being here a second time, and you'll probably know who he is and what he has done. More on that in just a moment. A few reminders here as we get set for the Thanksgiving holiday. Give thanks to the Hazard Ground by following us on all the social media sites, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Hazard Ground and Hazard Ground Podcast. Also, we'll thank you for leaving us an Apple review. Give us five stars. Tell us why you love the show. You'll help grow the podcast and We'll certainly reap the benefits of uh, being one of the more popular podcasts out there, especially in the military space. So we appreciate all those Apple reviews you'll leave us as well. And don't forget, as we approach the holidays, uh, about our promotion with Amazon, go to our website, headersground.com, click on the Amazon button at the bottom of the homepage or into the Sponsors tab. Go do all of your normal shopping on Amazon. Buy plenty of gifts for all family, friends, loves one. We'll get a percentage of what you guys spend, and then we donate a percentage of that back to some of the charities and organizations you've heard featured here on this show, maybe like the one that we're here today to talk about as well. This week's guest was one of our first ever guests on the show way back, episode number 11. So you'll have to go to our website, hazardground.com, and go all the way back and find this uh, episode of this guest. But he spent almost 10 years total in the military between active and and National Guard. He did three deployments overseas, and then he transitioned from the military to the NFL, where he had a short stint with the Seattle Seahawks. And then, after that was over, he founded a company, a organization called MVP, Merging Vets and Players. Uh, he founded it with Jay Glazer of Fox Sports, and it is an organization that I am personally a part of as well here where I live in Atlanta. It brings together veterans and former professional athletes who make that transition from their respective careers into another phase of life. It is Nate Boyer joining us once again on the Hazard Ground Podcast. Nate, welcome. Great to be with you as always, my friend. Thanks, Mark. Appreciate it, brother. Good to be here. Okay, and the reason I wanted to get you back on is uh, some of you may or may not be familiar. MVP now is a movie. Uh, Nate also <laughs> made the transition from, so write this down, folks, from military Green Beret <laughs> to uh, the NFL to movies. Uh, yeah, I mean, listen, uh, he does it all, folks. That's really what it's all about. So. <laughs> It's it's uh it's an inc- tries to he tries yeah, to it's it's an incredible story and I left out the fact that you were a former Green Beret duh um you know but it's interesting because and again real quick I'll you know give you the synopsis of the background for those listening you know one of the most amazing things that you guys won't know about Nate is sort of before he joined the Green Berets this guy decided to go help out uh, in Africa was it was it Darfur or Nigeria Darfur right it was Darfur yeah, yeah. so I remember you told me years ago that you got on a plane with like nothing but underwear and a toothbrush and sort of snuck into Darfur as a fake NGO. Uh, wait, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. My bag had that in it. Yeah. I was wearing more than underwear. <laughs> <laughs> Your best. I yes. had a full set correct. of clothes. You were wearing clothes, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, and it was, it's crazy because it was just one of those things where you saw what was going on over there and you're like, I just need to help, right? Totally, yeah. I was, uh, I mean, I was 23 years old. Honestly, I didn't have a lot going on in my life at the time. Uh, I didn't feel purposeful, really, in any way. Um, I'd thought about the military in the past. 9-11 happened when I was 20. So this is three years after. Uh, but, it, you know, I didn't, I, just, I didn't join for whatever reason. And I, I read this article, this Time Magazine article, about uh, what was going on in Darfur and how they were understaffed. And the, the title of the magazine uh, article was The Tragedy in Sudan. That's what the headline was. And I didn't really know much about it. I'd heard about this genocide. But uh, after flipping through and reading about what was going on and, and more, more so the images kind of speaking to me, um, I just felt compelled to go help. I wanted to be a part of, uh, you know, fighting for these people in some way. Obviously, it wasn't combat, but it just felt extremely unfair to, to be so fortunate, live in the place that I live. Uh, you know, I was just lucky to be born here. Like many of us were, didn't really earn that. And I, I felt like, man, there's, there's just something inside me that wants to go help people that don't have uh, these opportunities that we have. And, uh, and I was reading about 
how these refugee camps were like understaffed, under, you know, underfunded, undermanned. They needed people to help, you know, continue to build the the sites as well as uh, assist in the medical centers, pass out food rations, whatever that was. And, and so I called all the NGOs. They told me, well, you don't have any special skills. You don't have a college degree. There's nothing really that you'll be able to do with us. And I was like, well, I mean, uh, I'll fly myself over there. I just want to volunteer. Like, you don't, you, you don't, I, I'll figure it all out. Just let me help. And the, they were all just like, it's not that simple. You know, there's, there's a lot of red tape and blah, blah, blah. And so I just said, man, uh, well, I'm just going to go and get there. And once I'm there, I'll just figure it out. And they're, they're going to have to let me help. And, and they did, you know, I mean, it wasn't easy. But once I just showed up there, they were like, well, he's here. Let's just put him to work, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> and it was cool, man. I mean, I, I, just to be a part of that, uh, I really just, I kind of gained my patriotism over there by doing that and, and helping those people. I just wanted to to do it for a career, at least for a while after that. And and uh, so I was inspired to join the, not just the military, but I wanted to be a Green Beret because of the Special Forces motto, De Oppresso Libera, which means to free the oppressed. And the sort of the unconventional warfare uh, foreign internal defense piece of it where we, we work, work with train um, sometimes live with and, and ultimately fight alongside post nationals, Iraqis and Afghans uh, in this, uh, you know, in this, well, not current war, the war that just ended after 20 years. Um, I wanted to be a part of that and, and kind of have that, that piece of the mission. And, and so the special forces were definitely all about that. So it made sense for me. Well, and the biggest part of, I'll just figure it out sort of is, you know, the mentality of a lot of, of green berets, right? Like, I mean, sure you've been trained and you know everything else, but there's a lot of times where you're in a mission set that doesn't exactly give you a specific how to do it, right? Like the conventional army puts everything in steps and, and, you know, there's a task condition and standard and everything else. Green berets are sort of just like, well, the, the mission is to accomplish this and how you kind of get there doesn't always matter. So you just kind of figure it out as you go along. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you, you that's true. The, the mission isn't always clear. I think that's the same probably in conventional military as well, though. <laughs> At some level, like this is the desired effect. We don't exactly know how to get there. We think it's this way. But then as you go, I mean, you know, Mark, uh, you know, things just you have to adjust and mm-hmm. especially as a leader. You have to make some decisions sometimes, and you know it, it, the 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 environment and the resources and the objective kind of dictate the mission, you know, to an extent. Like you can plan, and as we all know, in anything in life, not just in the military, you can plan all day long, and it's important too, and have your contingencies and your, um, you know, your just in case situations. But the minute that you know, either the bullets start flying. Uh, literally or, or metaphorically, the plan kind of goes to hell and you got to <laughs> completely readjust and flex and just, you know, be, be, uh, adapt and overcome as they say. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, so three deployments, um, one to Iraq, two to Afghanistan or two to Iraq, one to Afghanistan. I forget what it was, but three right, one to th- Iraq, two to Afghanistan. Okay. I was yeah. right the first time. Um, you know, your, your combat experience, um, you know, and sort of looking back to where you are now and the formation of merging vets and players and everything, how pivotal was your combat experience in, you know, and you didn't know it at the time, obviously, but, you know, when you look back on it, how was how, that combat experience for you? How much did it draw, you know, you to sort of take that experience and catapult it into a positive and not so much a negative? Um, yeah, I mean, I think at the end of the day, first of all, like everybody has – struggles in their life. Everybody has, uh, you know, literal crap in their life. Uh, and not just literal, <laughs> you know what I mean? Figurative crap. Everybody. Yes. Yeah. 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 Figurative crap. Uh, but you know, I, I said this before and something I, I genuinely believe like there is, I mean, pe- uh, you have a choice to make when you're faced with that. Like you can, I mean, we're going to complain about it. Uh, everybody complains. That's just part of life. Military veterans complain maybe more than anybody, but we do something about it afterwards. Um, but you can sit there and let the stench overwhelm you, or you can turn it into fertilizer. You know, I mean, that is something that is that's that people don't often recognize. I think that 
the value in the losses and the value in um, lessons learned from, you know, getting your head kicked in a little bit uh, and, and uh, having to solve very challenging problems, whether they're personal ones or um, professional ones or, you know, global ones, whatever they are. Uh, all that stuff, you know, is making you into this stronger person who is more capable of, not only identifying, but facing those challenges. And I mean, op- obstacles are, are literally opportunities to be great. Like if you don't have them, there is no such thing as greatness. You can't do anything great if life's easy and if things are just smooth. So um, those those things are in, in a strange way, they're, they're a gift, not that you wish them upon other people. Um, but when you do face some, some real adversity in life, um, understanding that, all right, this is a um, this is a moment, this is an opportunity for me to uh, overcome something and uh, to grow from it, become stronger from it, and maybe inspire people along the way. You make the decision ultimately to leave the military, at least the active side. You do a couple of years in the Guard, but you know, obviously there was a, a, a something in you, a fire or whatever you want to call it, a passion to go do something else with your, uh, with your time, and um, you choose to go back to school. Uh, and you know, use that GI bill. Good job. Way to go. Yeah, congratulations. Um, <laughs> the best laid plans, right? Um, so, uh, you go back to university of Texas, even though you're a California boy, I'm not sure wh- how uh, yeah. UT got in there, but nonetheless, hook them horns sort of mostly. Uh, anyway, you end up in Austin and you decide you want to start playing football as well. How does, how does yeah. all this come to pass? Yeah. I, I mean, well, first of all, with the school, I, I I didn't want to go back to California to go to college. Uh, I love California in a lot, a lot of ways. It's a beautiful state. You know, uh, there's so much to offer. You know, I love the, the the restaurants and the weather. And but there's a lot of people. Traffic's horrible. It's expensive. <laughs> there's like there's definitely some negatives there. Um, but also, I just wanted to experience something different, and I wanted to go to a place, go to college at a place where I knew, or at least felt like. I would be uh, around more veterans and kind of feel comfortable as an older student. I mean, I was 29 when I was a freshman. So uh, being in a place where it wasn't just, you know, 19 to 22 year old college kids was important to me. And Austin is a pretty good sized city. There's a lot of people of, I mean, of all ages, but there's more people in their, you know, 20s, 30s. 40s uh it's a very active city at the time it was very cheap <laughs> it's expensive now um totally changed over the last 12 years but uh you know it, it was just and, and te- you know and it's texas like there's i think there's more um i mean there's so many military base army bases out there but there's there's a lot of i think veterans that are better texans and i just I know they're very supportive of their veterans with programs and resources. And, um, and also UT, it's a great school. Uh, it, it, I wanted to go try out for a football team in a place that, um, that was, that had a legendary program, you know, even if they weren't that good at the time, which Texas really wasn't, they were coming off of a really good run. And then we, you know, we weren't very good when I was there. Uh, but that's all right. Like I, I wouldn't train, I wouldn't change anything. I, I loved going to school there. It's a great college. And you know, that Longhorn logo, I remember being deployed and seeing it everywhere, you know, hanging in somebody's barracks rooms or when people in their cities, they've got a Longhorn hat on. I mean, you know, you watch, uh, you watch, uh, American sniper and Chris Kyle's got a Longhorn hat on and, you know, half the movie. And that was the reality. Like the, it's just a popular uh, that the branding of the Texas Longhorns is big in the military. And so I just sort of made up my mind. I was in Iraq when I made that decision. I was like, I'm just going to go to Texas. And I don't know anybody there, but that's what I want to do. And I'm going to try out for the football team because I never played before. And I just regret not playing. And I don't, I just, I, you know, worst thing that happens is I get cut and life goes on. So why not? Yeah. And uh, Longhorns and the, you know, the army Cav guys probably wear that same funny hat that I would never put on, but we can, <laughs> we can leave that alone. Um, you, you know, again, I, I don't want to totally skip over your, your football experience, just because, but I, I do want to focus a little bit more about MVP. But, you know, again, I mean, when you were at UT, did any of 
sort of the camaraderie of a locker room stick out to you similar to the camaraderie of whether it's the Green Berets or just the military in general? I mean, like, were, were you were you feeling sort of the same thing? Like, these are my guys and this is this is my team. And, you know, much like the Green Berets, we're all, we're all here for each other. I mean, there's got to be some of that similarities, no? Yeah. And I didn't really think about it. I mean, I think uh, it's common people that are in – on active duty in the military and, and athletes as well, whether in the middle of their sport, you're not really thinking about what it's like to transition out of that. You're not, you're not focused on the future of or what it'll, what will it be like when I'm a veteran or what will it be like uh, when I'm no longer, you know, a professional athlete that, that people sort of look up to and admire and care, you know, care about if I show up to something or not, because, you know, unless you're kind of that top, I don't know if it's 1% or 5% or 10% of, professional athletes when you get done like nobody really recognizes you anymore and uh, especially in a sport like football you you know you you got the pads and the face mask i mean even even uh, you're in atlanta even like hardcore falcons fans i guarantee unless for whatever reason they're they're around the team more like they're not going to recognize a lot of these guys on the street you know they may see some guy big dude be like oh he looks like he plays football and then come to find out it's like the you know it's the outside linebacker that they uh, they watch every weekend. They know his name. They know his stats, but they don't. It, it, to them, it's it's this uniform. It's this person in a uniform. This, um, in some ways, this like machine that's out there. You know, a uh, commodity. And I, I, you know, I, the, as far as the locker room goes, I just I, I didn't realize until much later how lucky I was to have the football locker room to to jump right into. Because I got out of the military. I took terminal leave in January of 2010. And I tried out for the team, uh, you know, two days after I uh, drove away from base and made it. And all of a sudden, I'm like in another locker room and have another mission and purpose and structure. And, of course, it's it's different. I mean, you know, we would never compare the war to playing sports. But, um, but man, the, there's so many similarities with the camaraderie and, the uh, you, you know, you have to sacrifice a lot to be elite, you know. It's not you're saying not sacrificing your life. You're not uh, you know willing to do that, but uh, it, it's 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 a lot. I mean, if you're a professional fighter, professional football player, uh, I mean any sport. I kind of I kind of lean into the combat sports more because I think there is more of that similar mentality of I'm willing to run into a fire, you know, uh, and, and and or a brick wall or whatever you want to say. Um, not every sport kind of has that mentality. If you play golf like that, you're probably not going to do so well. Um, but you know. It's uh, so you're ways, saying sure you my 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 angry drive where I just scream at the ball and swing as hard as I can is an effective method for scoring well. Well, I mean, when it's going 300 yards sideways, probably not. I don't know. You tell Gilmore me. Gilmore might disagree with you, but again, that's not reality. <laughs> so yes, yeah. You're, phew, there it goes. Exactly. It was here, and now it's exactly. gone. No, I get it. I mean, and and that makes sense. I mean, um, and particularly, you know, I I think too when you talk about the individual sports, um like mixed martial arts, I mean, there is, there's a certain of, you know, you only have yourself, right? And, and while, while in team sports, there is a, um, there's always somebody there working with you individually. And in a lot of those sports, it's like you bear the burden of all of your failure and all of your success in any given moment. And, and um, I think that that certainly creates a different mentality. Um, yeah. after, after playing UT, um, you know, there's obviously the NFL was there, but how does that whole thing come about? And, you know, Seattle and I mean, you know, w- w- did you know you want to go to the NFL? Or you were just kind of like bored and wanted to try something different and said, why not? <laughs> uh, you know, it, it, it genuinely hadn't really crossed my mind until I got asked to play in a senior all-star game in uh, Charleston, mm-hmm. South Carolina, called the Medal of Honor Bowl. Uh, I think it was only around for two or three seasons, but – there's different all-star games at the end of every college season. The big one is the Reese's senior bowl. Mm-hmm. And then there's the NFL PA bowl, which I'm, I don't know if that one's still around, I assume. And then there was, you know, the East West shrine game. Yep. And, and then there was at the time there was the medal of honor bowl. This is in 20, uh, end of 2014, beginning of 2015. And I got asked to play. They had the, you know, the national and American team, out there, it was it was sponsored by or hosted by the Medal of Honor Society, which was really cool. Um, and they said, "Well, you want to be on the? Do you want to be the national team's uh, long snapper for the game?" And I was like, "Yeah, I mean, of 
I would love that. That sounds, that sounds awesome. Get a chance to play one more time just for funsies, you know, not really anything on the line, but um, I'd been to Charleston a couple of times before. It's a great town. It, the game was played at the Citadel, which was really cool. So just a lot of reasons to say yes to that. And, uh, and we'd gotten our, we'd gotten our ass kicked in the last bowl game of my career against Arkansas. And it was just kind of a bitter taste because it wasn't very fun. We just didn't play well. And it was like, ugh, you know, I was in a bowl game. We were hoping to go to a slightly better bowl game and we ended up at this one and we, we obviously didn't show up um, on the field. And it's just, just one of those things. It would have been nice. You know, I was like, man, it'd be nice to play one more time. And this was the opportunity to do that. And so I went down there and at these all-star games, there's all these scouts during the week that come to the practices, you know, and they, at this game, it's it's mid rounders at best, mid round draft picks, and then you know undrafted potential undrafted free agents or guys that are going to go play, you know, in Canada or um, now they've got you know every other Except league that's trying to make and, it. Yeah, everything else. Yeah, yeah. So uh, those weren't really around yet, but uh, but anyway, so it was like, well, you know, I, I go out there and these scouts, like four different teams, asked to meet with me, and we're like, hey, you're going to try to play in the next level. I was like, uh, you know, I'm 34, right? And kind of small and not very athletic <laughs> compared to most of these guys. And they're like, yeah, but you're a good long snapper. And if you're consistent at long snapping, I mean, you're going to have to put some weight on. They, they all told me I need to gain about 30 or 40 pounds. Because in college, I played at like 190, 195 at the most. That was not big. Uh, but the NFL level, the rules are different on punt where, you know, you don't have a shield back there to – to protect the punter, you only have one person. So the long snapper has blocking responsibilities and, uh, and, and you, you can't cross the line of scrimmage until the ball is punted. Where in college, as soon as I snapped it, I was a free releaser. I was like a third gunner. So I'd snap it and I would just run down and try to, you know, make the guy call a fair catch. Like that was the goal pretty much. Cause you know, open field tackling a punt returner, not my specialty. I, had, I only had one tackle in college for that reason. It's just like, it's tough, man. Those dudes are, those dudes are quick. Yeah, it's, it's hard for a, yeah. a, a guy that runs four, four to make that play. Um, so I, you know, I was like, you know what, why not? And I came back to uh, finish my master's degree. I did an internship down in Los Angeles uh, at, at uh, uh, Peter Berg's production company, film 44 P Peter Berg. He, he directed Friday night lights and lone survivor and done a lot of military and football related content. And I was like, well, these are worlds I understand if I want to, you know, eventually work in film and television it makes sense to do the internship there. So I did that internship and also I reached out to uh, a guy named Matt Overton, the long snapper a long time with the Colts, with the Jags. Um, I believe Tennessee as well. Maybe I'm not, he may still be in the league, this guy, um, <laughs> cause these guys play forever. Uh, I need to hit him up and find out, but um, you know, Matt, Matt had followed my story when I was in college and was like, dude, you should, uh, you know, or I asked him, I said, Hey, where should I, where should I go train? Uh, if I want to try this and you know, give this NFL thing a go. And he said, you got to go to uh, you got to go to unbreakable. You got to go to unbreakable performance center and go talk to, to Glazer. He's like, that's where I work out when I'm in town there. I, I he's like, I guarantee he's going to love your story and background and what you're about. And Jay is just an outside the box kind of guy. Um, he's like, you should, you should just, you should just go and see what happens. And so I go down to the gym and I meet Jay and um, he sort of put me on scholarship uh, that spring. So, I mean, cause it, you know, it's a high end gym. It's, it's, it's not, there's it, a lot of celebrities and professional athletes that train there. And, you know, it's a fight gym, but it's kind of, it, it's definitely, it's, it's very unique. It's sort of its own thing. And, uh, and Jay, Jay helped me get that shot. And, you know, when the draft rolled around, the last day I knew I wasn't going to get drafted, but I was hoping to get a free agent opportunity. And after the last pick in the draft, I got a call from the St. Louis Rams and the Seattle Seahawks. And uh, the, at the time, you know, the Seahawks were, they'd been to back-to-back -back Super Bowls. I mean, that team was Russell Wilson and Marshawn Lynch and Richard Sherman and Bobby Wagner, and Michael Bennett, Earl Thomas, Cam Chancellor, Jimmy Graham just signed with them. Doug Baldwin, like it was a squad, you know what I mean? I mean, they had, yeah. They had some they had some ballers, and uh, and the Rams were four and twelve the year before. So no offense to them, but it was just it, 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 and it was St. Louis. Uh, uh, I'm going to get crucified for that by somebody, but it was like 
I was a West Coast guy and, you know, I was a Niner fan growing up. So the Seahawks were one of their biggest rivals, but it just made more sense, even though it was probably going to be tougher to make that team. Uh, it didn't matter to me. It was like the same mentality as going to UT. Uh, I wanted to be around a, a you know, the better program at the time and, and kind of, I, I just couldn't turn down that challenge. And so I, they signed with the Seahawks and, you know, and Pete Carroll called me directly. It was really cool. And I was just like, all right, uh, this is what I'm going to do. So I signed with the Hawks. I go up there, you know, went through OTAs, training camp. I was expecting to get cut at any moment. It didn't happen. Uh, we get into the preseason and I got to, I got played in one preseason game before they made that kind of big round of cuts. And I was part of, I was on the chopping block at that point, but, but just to get that opportunity to play in that one game and, um, to lead the team out of the tunnel with the American flag like I did in college uh, was pretty special. And, uh, yeah, I'll definitely always remember that and, and always be grateful for, for the Seahawks and, and John Schneider, the GM, and those guys just giving me a genuine shot. After you get released, um, did you know, you know what you were going to do next? And, and did you realize at the time, like, that's sort of that last of the environment that you're ever going to be around? Right. Like the military isn't a daily thing anymore, you know, uh, and that football locker room mentality, which is very similar, is no longer at your disposal. Did you did you stop and think like, hey, man, it's it's just me now? I mean, not until I was in that sitting in that chair, you know, uh, the day after I got cut. But, yeah, it kind of just hit me. I was like, dang, like, what am I going to do now? Um, I did have that passion and thought that I was going to do something in, in, you know, in the film and TV space, but I, you know, I would hope that I'd thought, well, this football thing, I'll, I'll figure it out. I'll find a way I'll make the team, you know, and I'll play for a couple of years at least. And then I can start to build towards the future of, um, you know, this, the film and TV stuff, whatever that ends up being, I wanted to be a storyteller and eventually a filmmaker. I'm like, this will be an opportunity to kind of set that stuff up. And it didn't happen that way. You know, it's just as it is with most athletes, it doesn't end on your terms. It just ends. And it's all of a sudden, I mean, that's one advantage, I guess, that maybe veterans have over athletes and not always, of course, if you get wounded or there's some other uh, circumstances that cause your enlistment to end early. Um, but with, you know, most of the time you you know when your ETS date is. You know when it. You know when it's going to wrap up. You know, like, all right, sign this contract. I just reenlisted. Whatever it is, two years from now, it's 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 over. So I have that time to sort of prepare and think about it. Even though most of us don't, <laughs> uh, it, it's you know it's it's at least there. But with the football uh, and a lot of these athletes, it's just you, you don't know when your number is going to get called, and all of a sudden it just just does, and and it's like clean your locker out and jump on the flight gets leaving today <laughs> it's so weird you know you, you don't really get to say goodbye and um it's a business at the end of the day and i get it um but there's just no way to really prepare for that yeah. and uh and so I, I hadn't really thought about what was next you know the first person that i remember calling me who i'd never met before i mean jay called me and people that i knew and were like, hey, brother, keep your head up. It's all good. You know, I, I went on, I remember going on ESPN, uh, NFL Live, I think, and talking to Sage Steele. And, you know, her father was in the military. So she got kind of emotional on the on the interview because. Her father was, was a colonel me, and graduated you know? from West Point. I mean, he was the first. Oh, he was a West Point guy. Yeah, he was. Yeah. I think he was the first um, African American to graduate from West Point that made 06, something like He's got some distinction. Wow. Um, that's amazing. Yeah, he's I need to got hit her some up. She's a, she's, a, she's, a, she's a cool. Yeah, she's a cool lady, man. I I love Sage. Uh, but yeah, but it was like, you know, she was pulling for me and it helped me realize a lot of people were, even if I didn't get to meet him or hear. And that was that was nice to hear. I mean, um, it felt good. But I was like, you know what? All right, I got I got to I just got to figure this thing out. And, um, and Chris Long, who had played, he was on the Rams at the time. Actually, Chris Long called me. And was like, hey man, uh, and and for those that don't know, he played eleven years in the NFL. He's actually he's actually Howie Long's son, uh, but he won a couple of Super Bowls as well. He's a defensive end. I think he was a second round pick in the draft. Mm -hmm. um, you know, back in uh, I'm not sure exactly what year. I'd guess uh, probably oh six or seven, something like that. But uh, 
you know, had a really good career and, um, and, and uh, one of those guys that in some ways a little bit fortunate in, um, in, in kind of knowing and somewhat dictating when it was going to end. Right. Um, but at this time, you know, he was still playing and he had started this organization called water boys. It was bringing clean water to East Africa, clean water wells, uh, raising money through NFL players. And he asked me if I wanted to be a part of that. And I said, can I do something involving veterans as well? And he said, absolutely. So we started to work out a plan and I was going to go up, uh, climb Mount Kilimanjaro with some vets and athletes and raise money for the wells in the process. And I was like, all right, this is cool. We're bringing vets and athletes together. Um, this will be fun. And, and I started talking to Glazer too about what I was going to do next. And I was like, man, I don't know. Like a part of me wants to just join the military again. I'm, I'm only 34. I, you know, I think if I get back in now before uh, it's too late, cause I just, I just transitioned out in February of 2015 off of uh, my guard time. So it was less than a year since I've been out. And he's like, no, 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 no. Unless you really, really want to do that. Don't do it. Don't just do it. Cause you feel like you don't have another choice or another option. Um, he's like, look, there's a lot of people in the, you know, the mindset you're in right now, a lot of vets and athletes that sort of feel that similar uh, sense of being lost. And he's like, I know, cause I talk to these athletes every day. They call me uh, when it's all said and done. And they're like, man, I never realized how much you helped me. And thank you um, for, you know, getting me that shot with that team or whatever it is. But uh, now what do I do? <laughs> you know? And uh, I've had that conversation with a lot of veterans too. And he's like, so let's let's start an organization that brings these groups to, together and, and, you know, on a consistent basis and kind of co- sort of coaches each other up, you know, through that transition. Those that have yeah. been through it, those that are going through it, um, ones with successful transitions, but also ones that are still kind of lost. And um, I'm like, well, what are we going to do with them? Like, and he's like, well, I don't know. We'll figure it out. But like, we just need to bring these groups together because – uh, I just think there's a mutual respect between the two and, and, and he's right. You know, there is And my biggest fear at the time, especially was like, well, I don't want to ever compare uh, the battlefield to the ball field. And he's like, well, then what's not, let's make sure that's very clear. People understand that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the locker room. Um, and so that's why we call, you know, our, our, our huddles at MVP huddles. Um, and, and it really does feel like a locker room. It's not, it's not about the workout that we do together. Like that's, that's fun. That's cool. It, 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 it's a way to, for us to bond a bit, kind of sweat together and, um, you know, work out, literally work out some of those demons, uh, but also gets us to a place where we feel a bit vulnerable and open. And, and then when we huddle up afterwards and talk, you know, you know, the people sitting across from you, even if you never met them before, at least you went through something together with them. And then you also understand that, you know, they also made a decision to dedicate their life to something that probably ended at a pretty young age. You know, I mean, the average NFL career is three years and the average uh, time of service for some, <clears throat> some of those lists is, I would guess, somewhat similar. Unless you're a career guy, a lot of these, you know, four-year enlistment is kind of the standard. And there's a lot of people that do that and, you know, get out at a pretty young age and hard to find anything that matches that uh, that camaraderie and mm-hmm. sense of purpose and feeling like you are important and you matter. And if you weren't there, if you didn't show up at work today, the machine wouldn't operate properly. You know, that's, that's, it's important to feel like you belong and, and uh, you're making a difference. And so that's how MVP started. And, yeah. and you know, beginning, beginning at the very beginning, it was, it was some vets that were living in a transitional house, a shelter you know, on sunset Boulevard in LA and I met these guys and some of them, you know, weren't exactly excited to see me come visit that place. Cause I think part of it was shame, but also they're just like, who are you to think that you can, you know, you should come in here and like, we need somebody to give us a pep talk. You know what I mean? I don't, well, I don't, I don't need a, I don't need that. And, and I didn't really think of it in those terms until I was in there and I'm like, yeah, I, I probably wouldn't be super stoked about that either. And if I walked in and someone was just like, if I was living in this place and somebody else walked in and was like, Hey, this is, this is, you know, this is the way to um, follow your dreams or whatever it is. And I was like, well, why don't you guys, and one guy in particular, Denver, who's, you know, now our national outreach director and 
uh, stood up the Dallas chapter. He was living in this place and, and Denver emailed me the next day and was like, Hey man, I'm sorry if I came off rude, but you know, I'm just, I'm just sort of stuck. And I feel like I, I just don't, I don't even know where to begin. And he's like, I, I, tr- I attempted for the third time to take my own life four months ago. And I just, I'm just struggling. I'm really struggling. And I, I'd love to get lunch with you and just kind of pick your brain. And I was like, all right, let's do it. So we got lunch and I was like, look, this is what Jay and I are talking about doing. I don't know if it's going to work, but what if you just brought some of the guys from the, the, uh, the Hollywood veteran center is what it was called. Why don't you, what if you brought some of those guys up to the gym and I'll see if, you know, if Jay can come and maybe, maybe try and bring some athletes in and we'll just like work out together. We got this gym. It's pretty awesome. Um, it'd be a good opportunity to get you guys out of this place for a bit. Uh, and he was like, yeah. So, you know, he rallied some of the guys up. They had like a van they could use and they drove up there. That was the first MVP session. It wasn't really like organized. <laughs> and, you know, as you know, like they're not, not everything we do is always organized no. uh, at the highest level. It's just like, it's just us getting together and we just, well, you know. But that's that's some of the allure of it, honestly. And, and, and again, you, for those listening, you've heard Nate kind of describe what MVP is each week. You know, it's it's veterans and athletes getting together. Uh, there's a total of eight actual chapters right now, including a virtual one. Um, you know, across different cities, and uh, obviously they're trying to expand into more. But you know, it's a 30, 45 minute workout. It's a little sweat equity together. You know, you pick each other up, pat each other on the backside, keep going, keep pushing. Um, you get a little sweat together, and then you just sit down and, and hash out life, man, together. Uh, and it and it's really that simple, but it really is that effective. Um, and allow me a moment here, just kind of give some more, you know, background on MVP. What I find more alluring about it than other places, and from somebody who's been through the VA and their whole process and everything else, you know, I mean, anybody who's ever been, for lack of a better term, quizzed or interviewed by a VA therapist, um, it's not always the most uh, easy environment to be in. Um, right. You know, and, and and anybody who knows anything about the VA, it almost feels like, and I say quiz because it's like, it almost feels like there's a right answer and the wrong answer leads you down one road and the right answer leads you down another. And that's not what it should be about. Um, because ultimately when it comes to your VA, you know, disability and compensation and all the other stuff, there's a lot of people looking at the words that you chose, not actually what you're dealing with. And so right. when, when it's MVP, there's no doctor, there's no evaluation, there's no diagnosis, there's no clinician. It's just somebody who can empathize uh, and give you their experience. Um, as, as any friend would, you know, and, and even though they're strangers for the most part, you might only see them once a week. It's that sort of connection. I think that allows people to, you know, easily understand and let somebody relate to what they're saying, because it's like you said, you know, just like Denver, who, oh, by the way, plug was a former guest on the hazard ground as well. Denver Morris, uh, was a guest here as well. He told his story, but you know, it's, Hey Nate, you know, I mean, I, I, I know what you're going through. I went through this and I did this and it's just people relating to one another. And I think that takes a lot of the pressure out of the situation and it makes it a little bit more of a, a situation where people thrive. Um, right. You're, you're not trying to, 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 to give a right answer. You're just speaking from the heart and somebody can relate. Somebody can empathize. Somebody can sympathize and, and somebody knows what you're doing. And even if they don't, you know, they're there to listen. And sometimes that's enough. Right. And so, that's kind of the environment that MVP creates weekly and, and why it really is a different organization th- than many others. Um, and, you know, fast forwarding, obviously, again, you started it there in, in LA and you did launch Vegas, other chapters, you know, uh, go to the website, MVP, <laughs> that's in players.org. You'll, you'll read more about it. But I, I, I want to fast forward a little bit because, you know, now MVP starts to take off and you get to this point now where, you want to tell this MVP story and MVP is now officially a movie. For those who don't know, it, it did screenings all over the country uh, and it was released on Amazon and, and Hulu, Amazon or Netflix. Uh, Amazon. It's on Amazon prime. It's on Apple TV, Apple TV. Sorry. Um, no, there's one more. And, and then uh, other places as well. I think Google play, I mean, okay. pretty much anywhere, um, you know, you know, video on demand. I mean, right. people are watching through Comcast. There's, there's all kinds of options. And so, so it, uh, but yeah, it but was the main released on Veterans Day for, for everybody to go see it. So, um, and, and I recommend it. And 
uh, I'll peel back the curtain here, you know, and, and again, because uh, Nate and I are on, on weekly calls together, and, and I mean, he's the president of the company now, so he runs around and those other things. But, you know, uh, I'll be I'll be 100% genuine. When I heard the idea that there was an MVP a movie, my first thought was, who makes a movie about a nonprofit organization? Like, how does this go? It's like, you know, that, that's like, it's like making a movie about like the front office of a team, not like the players on the field. It's like the front office. Right, like, right. You know, how interesting can this really be when it's just about how you form a nonprofit, right? Like, so you think of it in those terms and I'm like, okay, well, what's this all going to be about? And, you know, you watch the movie and it, it, it is so well done and it is so, um, it tugs at every emotional string that I think, and I'll only speak from the veteran standpoint. I won't speak for the athletes. I'm sure it feels that way for them. I'll allow you as a former professional athlete and military guy to speak for them. But, you know, um, it, it really does get to that place where there are so many things going on in your head that you can't sort out. Um, and all of those emotions sort of come to life on the screen. And just like an MVP huddle, it's like, hey, somebody understands. You know, and I think that really was the most poignant part of the movie, at least for me. And I told you that after we watched it. You know, um, I, I, I always feel like uh, when, when my body has, uh, and this is sort of just my personal PTSD, when my body has that, that, that jittery feeling and that anxiety when I watch combat live, like my juices start right. flowing, like I, I'm almost <clears throat> back in, this, in, in the shit, you know, like I'm back there again. And in a weird way, I want to be there again, but it's like, yeah, you're probably not in your best interest to have bullets whizzing by your head again and bombs going off everywhere. But I sort of got that same feeling during watching the movie because it was just more of that, I've been through this. Like, I, I know what this feels like. And and it really sort of, you know, got me a little bit deeper than I ever expected it to. To, to the point where, I mean, listen, I, I had tears in my eyes throughout the movie. Like, I, just because it related so well, it told such a such a story that, so many of us veterans have have lived, not exactly, but to an extent enough that we all understand. And and I think it was just, you know, to your credit, it was so well done. Now that I'm done bragging on the movie, um, I kind of want to just well, a- ask you about, no. you know, how you get to the point where you're like, okay, well, I want to tell this story again on, on a bigger platform. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you, Mark. I, I really appreciate that, brother. Because I think, and just to touch on that real quick first, the reason I think it resonates with us a lot because it resonates with me and, and and that might sound arrogant because I co-wrote it and directed it and I'm in it, but it, that's not why it resonates with me. It resonates with me because we're seeing us on the screen and behind the camera as well. Like every veteran played in this, in this, in the, in the film, every veteran portrayed on screen is played by an actual veteran, every single one. And that includes Dan Loria. Dan uh, was a Vietnam veteran and then went into acting and, He's the dad on the Wonder Years. He played Vince Lombardi on Broadway, actually. Mm-hmm. Um, and, he, you know, he's there's a part in the story where he, in the film where he kind of tells a little bit about how he felt when he came back from Vietnam. And then you've got these other vets, many of them MVP members who are in this in this movie. When, we, when I was rewriting the script from the original draft. After I was, while I was sort of casting it, I'm talking to these people and be like, and I was telling them like, so what, what do you want to get across? What story do you want to tell? So the reason I think it, it, uh, it hits us is because it's these real people telling their real stories. And so it feels almost like a a documentary at at, at moments and at times. And the same goes for the athletes, you know, when Tony Gonzalez and Randy Couture and, and, uh, you know, Jared Bunch, um, but specifically, you know, I want to, I want to. I mean, also, he's a former Falcon, but, you know, Tony tells that story of, uh, of him feeling like he'll never be great again and that he peaked. And he tells that real story about the moment that hit him and how, I mean, his, he, he, you know, his wife thought he was going to leave him. You know, she, she was so concerned with what, what was going on. And he didn't realize what he was feeling, you know, what he was feeling was that, um, what was bothering him because it's like he knew he was going to be a first ballot hall of famer he knew he had broadcasting career or whatever he wanted in front of him he he got to leave the game on his own terms and he still felt that loss and he shares that and it's like his it's his words you know it's not the scripts um and and all the vets behind the camera from producers to you know the co-writer with me to 
every department head, except for the VP, except for the cinematographer, every single one was also a vet. So it was really cool for us to have the opportunity to come together and make this thing. And I got to send a shout out to, to people like, you know, someone like Sylvester Stallone Mm -hmm. who lent his name to the production, didn't ask for anything, just said, put my name on it because people will read it. (laughs) And it helped. It helped us get it done. And Wiz Khalifa, you know, his parents, uh, uh, I believe both of them, but at least one of them was in the Air Force. He's a, you know, he's a, he's a, he's a military brat. He gave us a song to use in the movie. And like, just stuff like that really helped put, uh, make it feel like a much bigger production than it was with what we had budget wise. But I mean, to speak on what you were, what you were saying, what you were feeling, like, I, I feel that a lot of people feel that. And a lot of athletes feel that too. We screened it in Dallas at the Dallas International Film Festival and, and Brandon Carr, um, played for the Cowboys for a long time and some other teams, uh, 13 years, I believe. He'd never heard of MVP, the organization. He'd never, um, you know, he hadn't seen the movie, none of that. He comes to the screening. And afterwards, I asked him, you know, I was going to go up on stage and there wasn't a ton of people there, but there was a lot of athletes in the room. And I was like, hey, man, I, I was watching you and saw this kind of affected you. Do you want to come up and share a few things? And he was like, I would love to. And he went up and just, he like opened up for the first time about, you know, and I think he's only been out of the league three or four years, but he doesn't talk about it. He was like, man, like all these things I'm watching that Will Phillips character, the, the football player. And like, that's me. That's my family. That's what I feel. And it was crazy. And I was like, well, I mean, that's, that's the, that's the whole intent of this thing. If it's just, if it's just reaching bets and athletes, that's all that matters to me. Of course, if other people enjoy it as well, great, but that's who it's for. It's for us really. Um, and the idea to make it came about um, from from Garrett Jones, the the co writer with me. He's a he's a, he's a vet from the UK. I don't know if you've ever met G. Uh, no, I have Mark, but you but you should, man. He's he's a, he's got a podcast as well. Um, he's a brilliant he's a brilliant writer. He writes novels, military memoir, stuff like that. Just a really good dude. And he served alongside a lot of American Marines when he was overseas. Um, and kind of built that brotherhood. So he was out here visiting him and he in LA and he came up to an MVP session and he came to another one. And then he came to a third one. And he was like, Hey, you know, brother, I'd love to, I'd love to grab a bite with you. And, um, I have an idea, you know, and he, he went out to eat and he was like, I think this is a movie. You know, I heard you talking about how it sort of started. And, you know, this is, I mean, this is in 2018, it's like four years ago. And I was like, uh, yeah. I mean, in my mind, kind of thinking what you're probably thinking when you heard about the movie, I'm like, what? is this like what do you mean like this is <laughs> like a documentary yeah, yeah. Yes, or something like i would you know and he's like no i don't know and it's funny he wrote this first draft of it in like three days the guy's a psycho like he just won't sleep he'll just write and he sends it to me it's like 120 pages long which is about 20 plus pages too long for a, a movie of our size and the story very different from what we ended up shooting but to see his commitment to it and like how he sort of fleshed out some of these characters and kind of understood a bit of that experience just from listening to some of the guys in the room, some of the, and I'm talking specifically to the guys that, you know, weren't, weren't living in the greatest conditions and had, had dealt with the, you know, suicide and some other stuff. Um, and we whittled it down to almost, you know, uh, it's almost, it, I don't know if saying based on a true story is fair. Uh, it's definitely based on real people and based on true events. Um, because, you know, we, we did uh, take some creative liberties to make sure it is a cohesive, you know, hour 47 minute movie. I like it ended up, but, um, but it was great. I mean, and when we were sending drafts to the writer director of den of thieves um, shot in Atlanta, um, the uh, uh, Braden Aftergood, who's Stallone's producing partner, a uh, friend of mine named uh, Jordan Levin, uh, who used to run, uh, and he created, I mean, they're WB shows, but he created like Dawson's Creek and yep. One Tree Hill and these kinds of shows. We had these people that they were aware of MVP, they cared about the organization, and they gave it their time and just were like script notes, script notes, script, helping us out. Like, I've heard the story of the original draft, the original script of uh, Goodwill Hunting, where where uh, Will, Will Hunting goes to space. It's like a completely different movie that Matt Damon and Ben Affleck wrote, but they had people like that in their corner that were like, no, 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 no. What's interesting here is the relationship between the therapist and Will. Like, focus on that. So same kind of thing. We had people like focusing us in on what they thought was important. And 
the ironic part about that was it ended up kind of just being what MVP is and how it how it sort of started. And uh, it, I think it was a lesson for me and for a lot of us on the project that we're enough. Like our story is already enough. We don't need to add all this uh, excess to it, you know. Right. And that's for anybody. Like you're you're enough. You know your your story is powerful. I promise. You just got to figure out how to tell it effectively. <laughs> um, and I'm still working on that personally. Uh, but as far as the movie goes, man, I'm, I'm proud of what we got done, especially for what we got it done with. Um, and yeah, like it was out in movie theaters and now you can watch it on Amazon and, and Apple TV and other places. And we're working on, um, it's not done deal yet, but we're working on some licensing deals with some other, you know, big, uh, premium platforms. And, uh, I'm just stoked that it's going to get out there. It's going to be available for people to watch. It's awesome. And again, congratulations. I mean, you know, it's, it's, uh, I don't think I could ever write a book. I'm not sure I could ever, um, you know, make I don't think movie. I could either, honestly. Yeah, I, I don't, I mean, I think I could write a script because I have like a lot of ideas, but I don't even know where I'm going with it. Like I, I just, I'd be lost in the sauce. They, we'll you, talk. You, we'll you, talk. Got, you got all those either creative way. people to help you out. Like I, yeah, you'd be like, Hey, this is really stupid. This doesn't connect, but in my head it well, does. So. Way, you've got a great, uh, uh, a great voice for radio. Yeah. Well, uh, and, and your, and your, and your cameo, <laughs> yeah, I, your voice, your vocal cameo in the film. There, there was, is I, actually, I it's it. actually really good. Dude. It was really yeah. good. Cause you improv. So most background, I, gave you I, I do get a small little vocal cameo. There's a scene in the beginning where the athlete is it's in his not car. That small. It's, it's actually, yeah, size. I was actually surprised. Like it's literally <laughs> like three minutes of my voice and nothing else. Um, <laughs> So it, it, there's a scene where the, the, the athlete who just ended is, is listening to on the radio them talk about the guy who's taking his place. And Nate, out of the blue one day, calls me up and says, listen, I need you to do this thing for me. Can you just record this? I'm going to send you something. Can you just record like two or three minutes of this, right, about talking? Here's the guy's name. And just talk two or three minutes like he's just like, you know, been drafted. And I had no idea what I was. I just started talking because that's what I do for a living. <laughs> And I gave Nate two or three minutes, and I said to him, like, is that all right, man? And he's like, this is awesome. I'm like, do you need more? Is there anything? He's like, no, you're good. You're good. And then next thing I know, I'm watching the movie. I'm like, oh, right, that was me. Okay. It's, it's early on, on, too. It's like it's like five minutes in. Yeah, it's, like it's early on. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, um, like you said, I've, I've got a great face for, you know, movies and TV. You actually are a very handsome man as well, Mark. Oh, well, so thank you. That yeah, Nate, that's exactly um, the compliment I needed to, to get through the rest of my day. <laughs> um, no, so when you're speaking of compliments, when, when you've gotten reactions from people on the film, um, and if you want to leave their names out to protect the innocent, that's fine. Like, but like, what are some of the, <laughs> the things that people have stood out that they have said to you about the film that really just sort of have stuck with you? Or, or at least were maybe validation that, uh, you know, we, we did what we want. We, we got out of this what we needed to get out of it. No, I mean, and I, and I will, I will drop some some names um, because when we first screened it, the very first time in a theater, and this was the first time I actually enjoyed it because I hadn't had the chance to watch it in its finished, completed, um, you know, with the color correction, sound design done, everything mixed properly, set for a theater. I'd never watched it in that capacity, and, and not only did I watch it. In that capacity, I watched it with 350 other people in this theater, most of them MVP members or family, friends, supporters of them. Um, but a lot of vets and athletes were there. And I remember Kenny Maine and Sean O'Hara, who both work in, in television. Ken, you know, Kenny played college ball at Utah, or excuse me, at uh, UNLV, and was actually uh, uh, with the Seahawks for, for a heartbeat. In a, he was a training camp guy as well. And, you know, his career ended – and he went into broadcasting, very successful career. Sean O'Hara, obviously, I think he won a couple of Super Bowls with the Giants, offensive lineman, and now he works for NFL Network. So these guys understand media. They understand content, what's, uh, you know, what I think would be considered good content. And they both came out of the theater with wet eyes. And I was like, I was not expecting that. I was expecting, you know, a few people that are very close to MVP, the organization, to maybe feel some emotions and stuff. But not that. And that was like the first time I was like, wow, all okay, right, like we did it. You know, like we, we, we did it. Um, because Ken, I mean, Kenny was a wreck in the best way ever. He was just mm -hmm. like, dude, this is so beautiful. And like, I just, uh, you know, who was that person? Who was that person? And I was like, dude, they were, he was a vet. And, you know, and, 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 and that person, um, you know, her, her, uh, uh, you know, her, she, had, she had just veterans in her family and she was just drawn to the project and she was just interested in, 
he was just like, Oh my goodness. Like it was just beautiful. And, and then some of those, the veterans as well, you know, like, just like what you said a little bit ago, just to see them genuinely be affected by it um, and laugh at the moments I wasn't expecting them to maybe laugh at. Um, and uh, all that kind of stuff. I was like, this is, this is, this is great. Um, so that, that was kind of the moment where I really felt that. And those reactions were, um, were very uh, dear to me, you know, and we filmed, we screened it in Austin and Tim Kennedy came, you know, and Tim, um, mm-hmm. Tim loved it, man. And Tim, you know, Tim's a former MMA, you know, fought in the UFC as well as a green beret. And, um, so he understands both those worlds, you know, Randy who's in it, um, you know, uh, all those guys that Tom Arnold was another one. That's just funny to me because Tom, you know, I, I, I don't know if he grew up in small town, Iowa, he's kind of got his own, uh, uh, you know, way of doing things, his own opinions about things and all that. I didn't know he was such a supporter of the veteran community. And then I heard a story from him about his, he, he had a nephew um, who served that took his own life and it really affected him. And it kind of drew him towards this, the, this idea of like sort of the narrative we're trying to um, the positive narrative we're trying to tell uh, we're not, which is with MVP. A lot of veteran organizations do this and, and are a part of this, but you know, that, that you are still a value and, you know, no matter what, like, it's okay to ask for help. And like, we got you, we'll, we'll figure this out together. That kind of stuff. He said, cause I, he's like, I, I think my nephew just felt very alone. And I, and I wish I could have told him about this. I mean, his way of helping was I mean, pretty much just giving his time to be a part of the movie. And then he should, you know, not only did he show up at the premiere, but he was, he's done a ton of media stuff for us, just helping out. And, you know, he genuinely like loves the movie and you know he wants to know if we're going to be doing something else down the road. Like what can I do to help? And I don't know that kind of stuff. It's, it's really cool because he, you know, he's not a vet or an athlete, um, but that all that stuff is special. And and honestly, the person that I really probably the most wanted to make sure that we, you know, got it right and, and, and impressed him with because, um, you know, he kind of came up with this crazy idea. But it was Jay, it was Glazer, and Jay and Jay same way, man, like same reaction. I mean, he had just we just last Sunday it was on. Uh, I was on Fox NFL Sunday. They did a little one one minute piece about MVP, and then they threw it to Jay, and um, he could have talked about whatever he wanted regarding MVP. And um, you know, he talked about how we're coming up on our seventh anniversary, but then he just sang praises about the movie, you know, and was just like, "It's so, you know, go watch it. It's so good." And I was like, "Yes, thank you, brother." Um, so, yeah, really, really, really great reactions from those that matter. I mean. Uh, the only, the, the only, the few negative reviews we've got, um, are critical reviews by honestly, after reading them, I feel more like they're attacks on me as a person. And I'm like, all right, well, I mean, if that's, if the, I don't care about that, as long as you understand, um, who's involved with this movie and who made this and like what they were up against and what they all overcame and the time that they all gave, you know, to do it. Like, and, and, and pretty much everybody has been positive on the production itself and you know what we created yeah and again i mean it's you know i I was i was thoroughly impressed fully skeptical going in but i was thoroughly impressed on the (laughs) way out so you know and and again i i i I don't say that as a slight per se but it just you know in my my brain it was just hard to compute it but you know and again maybe it's just because i'm inside the organization right and and it's just like okay i i get it but i don't get a kind of deal and and you know, for me, I, I am somebody who outwardly is always very protective of the veteran space because I feel like a lot of it has been co-opted for a variety of different things throughout American society nowadays, politics, money, commercialism, everything else, right. you know, and I can't control any of it, but, you know, in the same respect, I, I don't always have to take part in it, but, you know, when it was a movie about an organization that I'm a part of and one that I'm close to, um, it didn't, and that's the other thing, it never felt like commercial. It never felt cheap. It never felt like it was... It, it, it just genuinely felt like a story and one that you wanted to hear. Whether you were a veteran or an athlete or not, it was a story that that talks about the human condition. And isn't that isn't that what what you know good movies are all about? You know the emotions and the humanity of of, of life that you know we don't all understand, but you know it comes to life on a screen for us. And I think just genuinely as a movie that happened. You know whether it was veterans or not, or, or military or athletes or not the emotion was palpable. And I, I think you, you hit a home run in that sense. So, you know, you did everything Thank that, you, that it was supposed to do. Um, and again, it's, it's out on Amazon prime. 
uh, as well as Apple TV. You'll see it more and more. MVP the movie. Um, look, I, I, I want to say thank you again for, for taking the time with us. But, you know, um, it's been an incredible journey. And, and, and it's crazy because, you know, you and I first crossed paths um, in the sports world while you were trying to make the Seahawks, you know, and I interviewed you on my right. radio show because I was a veteran and I'm like, I want to talk to this guy, you know, like, this is awesome. Anytime I see veterans doing great things and, and former military members doing great things, I'm like, let's, let's give them some airtime. Let's, let's get these stories out there. And then of course, you know, some may know it, the whole Kaepernick thing happened and that sort of changed the direction of your life and, and, um, good, bad or indifferent, you know, just sort of put you in a different space altogether. But, you know, you never really lost your compass, brother, and I, I, I do appreciate that about you. Um, Thank you, brother. You know, it's one of those things where I, I don't I don't think you're much different from the guy who grabbed his underwear and his toothbrush with clothes on and went to Darfur uh, not knowing with what the hell was on. going on. Um, now you're just working on in, in a different scale, right? But it, it, I don't I don't get a sense uh, of through any of this and knowing you for the last you know six seven years now. That, that any of this has really uh, changed who you are at the core, and I think that's that's super important for you and, and certainly super important for for all of us around you and, and MVP, you know, because it really is um, uh, the backbone of the organization still is you and, and, and what we, we strive towards each each week in our huddles is is to be a little bit better with everybody in our huddles. But, you know, again, that's a, it's a simple premise that you've brought to the entire organization. So I'm done rambling, but, Thank you know, you again, that. Um, continued nah, success. With the movie. <laughs> continued success with the movie. I appreciate man. I'm, you, I'm, I'm really, really, um, really proud of you, and really, really grateful to uh, to have to have called you a friend for a long time. And um, you know, and for what it's worth, Nate, Nate will still drop you a text every now and then and check in on you, check in on you because he knows just like it is uh, for a lot of veterans. Sometimes it's that text that makes all the difference. Just want you to know yeah. we're here, man. We're thinking about you. Uh, let us know if you need anything. Don't be afraid to, to, to call. And it's not because I don't love you that I don't. I just, you know, I know you're checking in. That's that's enough for me. And, and you always you always respond when I text about anything else. So you know, I, I know I know uh, I'm not on the not on the bad list. <laughs> Thank you, brother. I, I, I appreciate you, man. And uh, thanks for thanks for helping us out, especially in Atlanta, man. But with everything, and thanks again for lending those beautiful vocals. Uh, well, to MVP uh, the movie. I, I, I certainly am. Uh, it's, it's the height of my uh, my my literal career. Um, <laughs> It might not get any. It's only the beginning. It's get much beginning. higher than that. But again, go check out the movie. Uh, you'll see it everywhere. You'll find it everywhere. He's Nate Boyer. Uh, thank you so much, brother, for the time. Uh, again, continued success. I know you'll stay busy. We'll talk soon, obviously. But uh, I hope the Hazard Ground audience all takes the time to go see this movie. I genuinely hope you guys do. Whether you're watching here in America or across the world, uh, this movie, and take it from me, this movie absolutely will resonate with you on, on more than one level. So again, uh, Apple TV. Thank you, Amazon Prime, and look for it everywhere going forward. Nate Boyer, as always, brother, great to see you, and thank you for being part of the Hazard Ground. You too, brother. Thanks so much. You've been listening to the Hazard Ground Podcast, hosted by Mark Zeno. If you have an interesting story to tell and you'd like to be on the show, send us an email at producer at hazardground.com. And if you like the show, Don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review on Apple Podcasts. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.